Hi friends, thanks for stopping by Grains and Small Places. And today I wanted to show you another dinner idea. Um, I have a recipe for some sub buns or hoagie rolls, whatever you want to call them. And we're going to make French dip subs on top of those. So I want to show you, take you along to show you how we do that. And then also, this is going to be part of my br Make Bread 365 challenge. In January, I believe we did a sandwich bread and Hawaiian rolls. And then February, we did pizza dough. And then we did, so this month is going to be, I think I already put out the sourdough. It was kind of in between February and March. And then we're going to have the sub buns for our March. Don't worry, I'll go ahead and put the recipe link in the description box below for you. That way you have those and you don't have to write everything down during the video. So let's get started. Okay, so first things first, we're gonna start on the sub buns. I'm going to mill some grain. I'm using hard white wheat today. I love these containers that I keep my grain in. They're just kind of my everyday container uses. They seal really well and they have a nice wide opening so I can get big scoops in, those larger measuring scoops. And it actually comes with this little measuring scoop here with measurements on the side for me. So I keep larger grain bins in another area that I don't wanna to have to access every day. I love to use these for my everyday access. They stack really well and they fit together great. And I can link them below if you're interested. They come with these cute little labels and this little white marker also so I can put them on here just to know which grains are which. However, sometimes I can just tell by looking at them because they all have a little bit of a different look to them. But what I'm going to do is measure these out and I'm going to weigh them about 450 grams of wheat berries and make sure to zero out your scale when you put your container on there. But that's going to be about two and a half cups of the hard white wheat and that should yield me about four cups of fresh milled flour. Now you can use hard white here or hard red or a mix of the two even if you want to sprinkle in some kamut or spelt or something like that that is great in this recipe as well. But the hard wheat varieties is what gives us our gluten so we have a nice structure of the bread. And we're going to just put this in my little mill here and you can see me tightening the knob at the top. That's just making the flour finer for me and I wanna do this after I put the grain in my mill. Then I'm going to grab my little Bosch compact mixer. Sadly, this has been discontinued by the company, but I hear that you can still find some on eBay and Amazon and things like that. Um, there's a couple other websites that may still have them listed as well. I'll put a link below if I can find some, if you're interested in it. But here's the beautiful flower. And you can see the flower has no gritty, thick texture. It's nice and fine. And I'm going to heat up about one and a half cups of warm water or 350 grams. I'm gonna put that in the microwave and just heat it up just above room temperature where it's not too hot to put my finger in. Probably under 90 degrees Fahrenheit is what we would want. After I put in the warm water, I'm going to add about one and a half teaspoons of sea salt and I'm going to add in about two tablespoons of sugar. This is my raw cane sugar. You could use honey. If you do, you would just use the same amount. Um, or of course you can use whatever sweetener, different option that you like. And then I'm gonna put three tablespoons of olive oil in here. Now I really like to use this extra light tasting olive oil because it doesn't have any really strong flavors. And I just like how it works into my dough and how it tastes. So I usually buy giant bottles of this and have it on hand quite often. So after I've added the warm water, the salt, the olive oil, and the sugar, then I'm going to just mix those ingredients around so that they can just start to incorporate a little bit before I add in my flour. And then I'm going to add in my fresh milled flour. Okay, so you'll notice that I take the whole bowl of flour and go ahead and just dump it all in. Um, that's just because I know that this recipe works for me. I would recommend you leaving a little bit of the flour out because every recipe works a little bit different for each person. So you may need to, a little less or even a little more than what I have here. Um, no one recipe is going to be perfect for everybody. So 
I just wanted to throw that out there in case you've had problems with recipes in the past. Sometimes the recipe has been written for a drier climate or a more humid climate, and it really does affect the amount of flour that you need. Also, just the wheat berries themselves and the moisture content in them can also change how the dough works with the flour. So I wanna mix this all in until there's pretty much no dry flour showing anymore, and then I'm going to cover it. So I'm gonna cover it before I put my yeast in, and this is just a version of a sponge method. A sponge method is where you just take your flour and some water and you let it soak for a little while before you add the other ingredients and start kneading. So I have tried that method before and added my other ingredients afterwards, and I just find that this works better for me. You can choose to do it however you prefer, but I really like the method of just mixing all the ingredients except for the yeast and letting it sit so that the flour has a chance to absorb the water and all the, the liquids, basically. You don't want your dough to be dry, especially at this point, because it will start to get drier as it absorbs your liquid that you're using for pretty much any fresh milled flour recipe. Fresh milled flour does tend to absorb more water when we're using the hard varieties than just the commercial white flours that you can get. So I want my dough to be somewhat sticky at the stage of where I'm going to cover it. So if you forget about it on your counter and let it go for an hour or even more than that, it probably will still be fine. Just 10 minutes is the minimum that I would recommend that you let it sit before adding the yeast. I've left it sit longer and actually the longer you let it sit, <laughs> the better results I end up getting from it. So don't worry and stress about it. If, if you leave it on the counter, you go do something else and you forget about it. I've done that too. We've all been there. After it sat for a while, you can see it's already starting to get stretchier. Um, I'm going to just mix that in. You can see I've still got some dough around the edge of the bowl. And I'm, before I start to put the yeast in, I want that to start incorporating on itself. And I'm going to use about two and a quarter teaspoons of instant yeast. I really like the instant yeast or the bread machine yeast that be, because it acts a little bit quicker, I don't have to proof it. I can just throw it right in here. I have heard that people have had success using the just active dry yeast, throwing it in here without proofing. I have not personally tried that, so I don't really want to recommend to do that. <laughs> but if you have experience with that, feel free to go ahead and do that as well here. And then once it starts to pick a little bit off the side of the bowl, I went ahead and put the yeast in. So the price has risen here in the United States on yeast and many other grocery products I'm sure you all have seen. <laughs> um, but I lucked out and was able to find bulk yeast, um, the kind that I really like to use at Sam's Club. They sell two pounds and the last time I bought it, it was I believe around six dollars, which kind of surprised me because those small jars that I used to purchase, their price had gone up to about four to six dollars. So now I'm able to have two pounds of yeast and I keep it in my freezer. I keep one of those jars that I had bought previously and I just keep refilling that and that stays in my refrigerator and that's what I use every day. And then I'll just keep refilling it from the stuff in my freezer and it helps save a lot of money and it keeps it nice and fresh and I've never had a problem with it going bad or dying on me. So now you can see everything has been incorporated, all the sides are clean, but the dough is still a little sticky. Um, I do like to work with a stickier dough. I'm going to check for the window pane test. We want to make sure that we knead it all the way to the window pane test. That's what gives our nice stretchy fluffy texture that we like from like the store-bought bread um, sometimes with fresh milled flour a lot of people will make the mistake of under kneading and it will make it be crumbly or fall apart or dense um, not soft and squishy so we want it to be very stretchy and i do have a little video of the window pane test i can try to link it here if you're interested in that but i just coat it with oil and then i'm going to cover it I'm gonna let this sit for about an hour. Um, sometimes it takes a little longer than an hour, but as this rises, we're gonna go ahead and get ready on our French dip subs. So here we're just using one yellow onion and we're just gonna chop it into little slivers. As you can see, Matt's helping in the kitchen with me again. He loves to help in the kitchen, but he doesn't necessarily love to be on camera. So this is what works for us and we just kind of work together. 
And then you can see up to the top, we've got two cups of beef broth and a bay leaf floating in there. I recommend using about a two to three pound chuck roast. This one was slightly under two pounds and it was barely enough meat for the four subs. So next time I would make sure to get a full two pounder or even a little bit larger. But you could, of course, if your family is larger, use a larger piece of meat. We're just gonna put that in my slow cooker and this is my little ninja slow cooker. I really love it. It has a lot of options, but I don't think that they sell them anymore. If they do, I'll link it below. We're just going to put some salt and pepper on here, just a basic seasoning because most of the flavor is going to come from the broth. So we're going to go ahead and put those onions just right into the slow cooker. And in that beef broth, we used about a quarter of a cup of Worcestershire sauce. I personally would probably use slightly less next time, but the rest of my family loved it. So it really depends on your taste. If you like the flavor of it, go ahead and use the quarter cup. If you don't care for it, then I you could bring that amount down a little bit. We're just gonna cover it, put it on low for about seven to eight hours. We want the temperature to be about 190 degrees Fahrenheit at a minimum, so that way it's nice and shreddable and soft. So while everything is cooking, I decided we need a dessert and I didn't want to make anything from scratch today besides the sub buns because my mixer was already full and everything. So I like to keep these little cookie ball, cookie dough balls on hand in my freezer. I, when I make them, I will make extra or a large batch and freeze them and just keep refilling these little freezer bags. That way I can have different kinds of cookies whenever we want and they're ready to go quick and easy and I can even mix and match them and just if someone else wants a different kind of cookie I can pull that kind out as well. So they're just going to bake these really quick straight from frozen and I can link this recipe below. They are literally the best chocolate chip cookies I have ever had and everyone that tries them loves them. Okay and I went ahead and just grabbed some of the cookies that I had in the freezer so that we can have a quick dessert and these are the chocolate chip sourdough cookies that we make with the brown butter these are just about our family's favorite cookies so i will link this recipe in the description box below too because they are delicious and i used to have another chocolate chip cookie recipe that i was die hard about this one took that over so this recipe is literally my favorite chocolate chip cookie recipe. All right, and now it's time. The bread has risen and we're gonna go ahead and shape it. If you notice, I got this little mat as a gift, so thank you for that. And it will help hopefully keep my table a little bit in better condition as you have seen in previous videos. It's seen better days. <laughs> so I'm just gonna uncover the dough. I like to put a little bit of olive oil on my work surface instead of flour because I don't like my dough to dry out. So if you are making this recipe without a mixer and you're doing it by hand, you may want to use more flour than what I use um, just because it is a soft, sticky, kind of wet dough. <laughs> you can see the texture of it is really pillowy and nice, so that's great. I'm just gonna put it kind of just in a little ball here so I can cut it into four equal parts. This is gonna make me about four, well, it's gonna make me four sub buns, but they're about, I don't know, six to eight inches long. If you wanna make more than that, you could double this recipe, but I would not recommend fully doubling the yeast, just only using up to three teaspoons of yeast if you're gonna double the recipe. And that will get you more sub buns and you can either make more subs or you could make extras and throw them in the freezer so you have them ready to go next time. So I'm gonna take these four equal parts, just put them in a little ball, and each one individually, I'm going to flatten out and roll them up. Kinda of like you would do a cinnamon roll if this was just like, you know, a mini version <laughs> without, the, without the filling, of course. As I flatten these out, I don't wanna stretch it too much because I don't wanna break the gluten fibers. So I just wanna kind of push and just gently push most of the air bubbles out here. And then as you can see here, I'm rolling it up, trying to keep it fairly tight so I don't have any gaps. And then I wanna take the ends of each sub roll bun here and fold them under so that no seams are showing and then just pinch them together. And then what you can see what I'm doing with my hands here, I'm just kind of cupping underneath and pushing the sides of my 
hands in at the bottom towards each other to pinch the bottom of that loaf. And this is creating surface tension and we want surface tension for free formed loaves. And then I'm just gonna kind of smash them down a little bit so that they don't bake too high up and I get a nice well-rounded bun. But that surface tension I wanted to note again is one issue if you're just rolling it up and not having any like the dough is tight on the top, you may have issues with the form after it's done baking. So this is a step you don't really want to skip, but you can see me rolling down um, the edges in there too. And there's just kind of squeezing and pinching and <laughs> pushing it together. And actually shaping dough is probably one of my favorite parts of bread making is just kind of getting in there with my hands. Um, I did used to knead my dough from my hands without the mixer. Um, but now I do have problems in my wrists, probably not related to kneading, probably related to other things in my past that I've done. But I really, with fresh mold flour, recommend a mixer just because I have had to knead this for 30 minutes in a, mix in a mixer before to get the window pane test. So I just, if you really love kneading, that's fine. But if not, a mixer really does save you a lot of time. But I'm not saying it can't be done by hand. <laughs> So I'm almost done shaping out all four loaves here and I'm just gonna put them on this pan and I like to line it with parchment paper so it's easy to get off the pan when they're done baking. And I'm gonna cover it again with just that same piece of cling film. I'm looking into alternatives of shower caps and things that people have mentioned to me in the comments and I hopefully look to upgrade to some of those soon so that I can reuse them. While these are covered, they're going to sit at room temperature for about 30 to 40 minutes. Again, this varies for every kitchen and every person that makes them, but today I believe it took about 30 minutes and then I preheated my oven. Now I have a little tiny oven, so it preheats pretty quickly. So if you know how long it takes for your oven to preheat, then I recommend preheating that while these are rising at that point in time. I preheat it to 400 degrees Fahrenheit and I'm going to bake these for about 20 minutes. And now you can see they're beautifully doubled, they're nice and puffy and ready to be baked. I'm going to spray them with water and that's just going to help in my oven to create the steam. I'm going to spray the oven as well. If I had a steam oven that would be awesome, <laughs> but I don't. So now they're done, and if you aren't sure if your bread is done or not, you can always temp it. I, yes, I use a meat thermometer to temp mine. 190 degrees Fahrenheit is what you're looking for for this type of bread. And then I wanna make sure to get it off the pan pretty much right away while they're still hot. Just be careful not to burn yourself. And I'm gonna pull the parchment paper out so that it doesn't get any wet condensation on the bottom. And now it's time to check on the meat. Sorry, we fogged up the lens here a little bit, but it's looking delicious. I did get a little bit smaller. So we're just going to pull that out and leave the liquids in here for just a moment. And we're going to take it into a bowl and just shred it. And you can see over here, we have our little induction top burner with our cast iron skillet. And we're gonna go ahead and just start getting that heated up because we decided we wanted to grill these buns. And at this point, they have cooled enough that we'll be able to cut them in half here in a moment. While Matt was shredding the meat, he tasted a piece and said it was excellent. So I'm happy to hear that. So we're just gonna cut the sub buns in half, basically hamburger style, I guess. Um, we're going to just cut it all the way across if we can here. And look at the texture of the inside of these. I just had to show you. And we're going to butter each side and then put a little bit of garlic salt in here or you could just do garlic powder with a little bit of salt just to season up the insides of the buns and then grill them lightly before we add the toppings. You of course don't have to do this step if you don't want to. We just thought it would kind of level up that flavor for us. Nice and golden brown. And then time to add the toppings. So we're adding that meat that we shredded earlier. And then for the people in the family that would like to have the onions, um, we're gonna put the onions on there and then some sliced provolone cheese. 
You can use any kind of cheese you want. You could skip the cheese if you want also, but I do recommend the cheese if you can. It's delicious. And then since everything is cooked, we're just going to put our, our oven on broil and just broil this till the cheese melts down. The meat's already hot and everything. So I would say maybe one to three minutes just until the cheese is browned and bubbly. And then while that's broiling, we'll go ahead and grill the top of the buns. That way they'll be ready to go as soon as the subs are done. And this sub bun recipe was part of my Make Bread 365 challenge that I'm doing for the entire year this year. Um, so far I've been successful in getting new ones in and not buying as much bread products from the store. I have so many more recipes coming up with just everyday items. I plan to do all kinds of things. Um, we've already done some sweet rolls and Hawaiian rolls. We've done sourdough bread and bread bowls and we've done pizza dough and I plan to have so many more coming up. So don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell so you'll get notifications every time I post a new video. If you're not a video fan and you prefer written or you like to print out the recipes, you can check out my blog. I'll put a link in the description box, but it's grainsinsmallplaces.net and I have all of these recipes and tips and tricks over there if you want to check that out. Also, if you are enjoying my content, if you want to head over to Facebook, I have a little Facebook page over there for Grains and Small Places. And that's where I post every time I post a new blog post, every time I post a new video, and I put the shorts over there as reels so you can check them out. Sometimes they're helpful tips, sometimes they're just silly, and sometimes they're just kind of things I like to show you. So I really appreciate all of the kind words that you've all given me and encouragement because this is a little out of my comfort zone. So again, thank you. Wow, look at those, even better than the restaurants. All right, we're gonna let those cool down and put the tops on. And then we get to dish out the delicious au jus or au jus or however you wanna say it for the dipping. I guess that's what gives us the French dip part of it. So we're gonna go ahead and enjoy these. hanging out with me today as we made these French dip subs. I hope you liked what you saw. Don't forget to give me a like and comment, share this with your friends, and also check out my blog at grainsandsmallplaces.net. We had a little facelift recently, so if you haven't been there, go check that out and let me know what you think about the new website. So thank you so much for stopping by Grains and Small Places. Goodbye. Bye.